I wish to share with you an adventure I embarked upon a year ago and which is changing the way I go about being a translator. But first I need to tell you a little about myself, uh, more specifically about my approach to reading and to the aesthetical experience in general. People are often surprised when they hear me say, oh, I've read this wonderful book, and, and they later discover I actually listened to it. As a blind person who learned Braille relatively late in life, uh, reading is something I do mostly with my ears. And, and I ask you, would you expect someone who reads in Braille to say, oh, I've been stroking this wonderful book? I readily admit that reading with one's ears has its specificities, uh, chiefly having to deal with a voice, whether it's a, a human voice or a, a digital voice. Just so you know what I'm talking about, listen to this recording of a digital voice. We're here to tell you the story of an experiment and a tool called the Zoom Book Platform, which we and many other researchers in different fields are working on slide with blonde page with names of people who are involved. Whatever the type of voice, as far as I'm concerned, I I'm reading. I'm focusing on the words, on the prose, uh, on the construction of each sentence. I, I suppose this is so because I've had to become somewhat of an expert at reading with my ears. Now, I, I never taught myself to do this. It, it was just part of the process. Basically, when, when, when you're always thinking in terms of words, why this word rather than another one, when you're always dealing with language issues, well, then your, your brain is geared to do just that, whatever the medium. Uh, I suppose that n n neurobiologists biologists know what's going on in our brain, but personally, I don't have a clue. Naturally, I've uh, become more attentive to the sound of words rather than their visual aspect. But for me, th that's not th the crucial point. In fact, um, visualizing things in my mind is not something I'm inclined to do. I, I never taught myself to visualize a landscape, to uh, visualize a street, my surroundings. Instead, I focus on the senses which I can fully explore. You know what? Uh, Let's give you a little taste of what that feels like. Let, let's turn off the lights. Why settle for a watered-down version of the sense you no longer have when other senses are still available, which can provide an intense experience in their own right? Uh, naturally, I'm not talking about practical matters. Uh, I'm talking about the aesthetical experience. I feel very deeply that when you try to convey the visual dimension to a visually impaired person, you are bound to fall very, very short of what life has on offer because words just don't cut it when it comes to rendering the beauty of a, say, of a landscape in Brittany or of a Vermeer painting. Just try to transpose this for one second. Imagine how you could compensate through language the loss, say, of, of hearing. Oh, good luck trying to express with words what you experience hearing a child's laughter or listening to the Goldberg variations. It's pretty ludicrous, and it probably explains my approach to, to sight loss. Let me share with you a little anecdote to, to illustrate the point I wish to make. Having lost my sight very gradually, basically over a period spanning three decades, there was a time in my life when I was neither truly blind, neither truly sighted, d depending on the type of situation I found myself in. I got the opportunity to go see a movie, Schindler's List, with what's called audio description and was fairly new at the time. Now wh what they do is they fit into the soundtrack wh whenever uh, gaps in the dialogue allow it, small vocal descriptions of what's going on on screen. 
a visually impaired person can then wear a special headphones providing the audio description. Now, m my situation at the time was that I could still see huge chunks of the screen. So I hear this bit of audio description which says, the heroine is smiling. And I can still see more than enough of her to, to grasp how far those words were from capturing the actual expression on her face. Those words were so, so far from capturing that smile. I, I think now's a good time to turn the lights back on so you can compare what you might have imagined in your mind with a selection of smiles. Okay, I, I'm running on and on and I still haven't said one word about translation. Um, so actually I became a translator before going blind. That the first three books I translated, I did so without any assistive technology. Uh, I still had enough sight left. But by the time I was translating a fourth novel, I came to the realization that I could no longer uh, carry on that way. Uh, my, my initial reaction was, uh, I'll, I'll move on, I'll, I'll try to do something else. Uh, I, I thought about becoming a, an English teacher or a, a piano tuner, but this didn't pan out for various reasons. Uh, I recall a, a time when I was uh, probably, a, I was a little depressed, uh, let's say it, uh, because I, I simply had no idea what I was going to do with the rest of my life. Uh, now, right from the start, I'd been told about the assistive technology which was available, but I just couldn't picture myself listening for days on end to a dreadful digital voice. Uh, an anyways, to, to cut a long story short, uh, two, two years down the road, I was probably ready to accept my fate, and it so happens that I stumbled upon an ex-colleague in the metro, and uh, I told him what I'd been up to, and he told me about a friend of his who ran a company specialized in assistive technology. Oh, I was more than glad to take his friend's number, and the following week I was given a demonstration of what the, the technology could achieve. Now, th that was 15 years ago, and I can still recall very, very vividly how I felt. I felt like the guy who arrives on the wharf late and sees the boat pull away. I, I could see that here were tools which uh, could very clearly enable me to go on doing what I, what I like and what I'm probably good at. Uh, only uh, wasn't it too late to backpedal. Two years had gone by, uh, but publishing is a very, very tough world. Uh, getting to know people, earning their trust. All this takes time and, it, and is quite fragile. Uh, as it happens, I, I was able to go back to, to translation and uh, I was pretty successful at it. However, um, last year I, I, I came to the realization that being a competent translator just isn't good enough. That there are too many English translators in France Increasingly, publishers are, are turning to other languages. Uh, English translations are hard to come by. It, it's a highly competitive field. So, so a passive attitude just doesn't cut it. So f faced with that situation, I decided to, to become proactive and to try my hand at finding good books which haven't been translated yet. Uh, so um, when, when in November 2012 I, I set off on my uh, hunt for novels, I recalled articles I'd read on a uh, crime fiction blog, maybe two or three years back, about Stan Jones, uh, an American novelist based in Alaska, with uh, four uh, novels to his credit. Now, th though I'd probably read uh, thousands of, uh, or maybe, well, yeah, thousands of articles about uh, thousands of books, those ones had really, really stuck in my mind because of the way they were written. I really felt there was something about that author. So I, I went back to the blog, I reread the articles, and I decided to give it a go. I ordered uh, used copies on Amazon of, of the first two Stan Jones novels, but as I went for the cheaper but much slower shipping rate, it was only mid-December when they finally made it to my mailbox. So I, I got down to scanning uh, White Sky, Black Ice, the first of Stan's novels. It'll take me about an hour and a half to scan a 300-page book. I end up with a text format file, which I 
copy onto a memory card. I then insert the memory card into this reading machine, which uses what's called text-to-speech software, which will take digital text and read it out loud through s synthetic speech. And uh, voila, the, the reading can begin. Now, r right from the start, I, I can sense there's an undeniable quality to the book. And, and that feeling only grows from page to page. By the time I've finished the book, I'm fully convinced I've gotten hold of, of a real gem. So, so I keep my fingers crossed and I go on to the second step, checking whether French translation rights were available. Uh, I contact the American publisher and after some insistence on my part, they let me know in uh, January that there is a French literary agent to whom I should address my query. I do so, and the French agent informs me that the Stan Jones novels are being considered by a French publisher, Le Masque. Uh, you, you can't imagine what a downer this was. I, I felt absolutely convinced that there must already be a translator onto it. My initial reaction was, yeah, well, well too bad, let's drop the whole thing. But uh, upon reflection, I, I decided to, to persist. It so happens that I, I had that publisher's email, though I'd, I'd never written to her, because I, I knew that nothing would good would come out you know, of any old email asking, oh, could you please give me, give me some work? I mean, she probably gets 50 of those a week. And, uh, but, but now with that whole Stan Jones story, it, it felt like the perfect opportunity to contact her. So I wrote her a short but, but very enthusiastic email, basically saying I've, I've read the first of Stan Jones's novels and I really love it. And if you're thinking about publishing him in French, well, I really would like for you to give me the opportunity to, to convince you that I'm the right translator for the job. Now, I, I must confess, I, I didn't hold much hope. <laughs> and she got back to me on January 4th a very nice email uh, saying that she hadn't gotten down to reading Stan Jones, though the agent had recommended the author to her. She suggested we meet two weeks later, uh, by which time she hoped to have read the novel. Uh, w w when that meeting finally took place um, on, a, on a snowy Tuesday morning, which I took as a positive sign from the heavens, uh, it turns out she still hadn't read the book <laughs> because of her hectic schedule. Uh, I, was, I was able to tell her at length uh, why I was so fond of Stan Jones, uh, having in between taken time to read the second of his books and having found it just as well crafted. She told me, well, you know, w we'll see about Stan Jones, but uh, whatever the outcome, we'll probably get to work together uh, sooner or later. So th though, it, though it was a, a disappointment to have to wait some more time, to, to know what she f thought of the books, I, I knew something good was probably going to, to come out of it. She, she called me in, in March to, to tell me that she really had enjoyed the books and that she was buying rights, uh, uh, French translation rights, to the first two novels. And one last hurdle remained. Uh, she asked me to submit a translation of the first chapter uh, before deciding whether she would entrust me with the job. Uh, you can imagine how much uh, sweat and thought went into those 20 pages. Uh, she called me in late April to, to tell me she was happy with the submission. Uh, that's when I finally knew that, that the Stan Jones story would have an outcome I, I, I would never have dared to hope for. The, the, the few colleagues I've shared the story with tell me that it's, it's quite rare for a translator to have the opportunity to bring a, a new author to a publisher. I, I guess it's what you call beginner's luck. Um, it's such a lovely story that I wanted to share it with the author. Uh, the, the following day I wrote uh, Stan Jones a, a pretty lengthy email with the subject heading, How Your Books Came to Be Translated into French. Uh, he got back to me on the same day, which wasn't really a surprise, as, as I read on various blogs that he was always keen to, to correspond with readers. Uh, other emails followed. That there were points I wanted to clarify. He, he sent me this extraordinary bibliography about Alaska, about Eskimo life and folklore. I also um, asked him whether any uh, articles had been published in the press uh, about his work, and he sent me this, this extraordinary 
a, a, a very long interview full of wonderful facts about how he came to writing. Uh, his, his day job is, uh, is, is deals with uh, environmental protection. The, the first French translation should be published in the fall 2014. Now, uh, one, one thing this story has taught me is that f for all of us, um, f finding the right balance between accepting one's lot and striving for better things I is far from easy. F for me, uh, coping with, with sight loss has been a long road down that path. You, you, need, to, you need to come to terms. You, you need to accept. But you, you also need to try to move on. Uh, looking back, I, uh, I realized that for many years I, I curtailed my goals and my ambitions as a translator. Uh, somewhere in the, in the back of my mind, there was this idea that being a translator while having this disability, well, well that was good enough. For instance, I always took it for granted that I should not waste any time looking for new authors. With so many translators out there on the hunt, what would be the use? I mean, I, I can no longer walk into a bookshop, pick up a book, skim through it. You know, I, I've lost that mobility, that agility which only eyesight can provide. But by thinking this, I, I was probably not giving enough credit to the fact that I've always been good at praising stories, at, at seeing something in a book. May maybe I do have some kind of talent for that. Sure, I probably needed the time to get used to the technology and to learn how to cope as a visually impaired translator. Uh, still, I, I could have tried earlier on to, to broaden my perspective and to take things further. Once again, you, you need to accept, but you also need to strive. I, it's, it's a very fine line. And granted, uh, it's not always easy to tell uh, what's uh, useless perseverance and what's a useful go uh, endeavor to reach one's goal. Y you, s you sometimes lack the lucidity to, to tell the difference. Th this is true of so many situations in life. Also, Maybe I was just lucky, but, but then so what? I, I can tell you one thing, I, I'll try again. Th th this whole story has given me the, the, the desire and the confidence to do so. I, I'm discovering um, a more proactive way to be a translator. And, and the, the adventure itself is worthwhile. I, I've always held th this belief that there exists stories and books out there which manage to survive because one person continues to care. Because I if one reader cherishes a story, he he'll want to, to share it with, a, with someone else. And so the story lives on. Now, I I'm well aware this probably sounds a little naive, but if you stop and think about it, a little naivety can sometimes carry you a long way. That whole Stan Jones story, I got the feeling I was living out this belief of mine. Even if it happens to me only once, I am so thankful. A and also, you know, I, I feel that he's just the right guy for that type of story. I it feels so right. A and it feels so ironic. I, I mean, a guy writing novels in Alaska and a blind translator in Paris. I, I mean, what were the odds? I just love that. Thank you. <laughs>